It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for this generous invitation, for this opportunity of talking with you, and especially and above all, to be able to start proposing a topic that, which I hope will inspire you the rest of the week. I will be talking about an idea of about a, pers a very personal and passionate idea, which is the topic of the queer ecologies. And for this, I will be talking initially about motivation. And above all, just as one of, just to give an initial idea, is just to say that nothing that I will see here will be able to be used against me or the Von Humboldt Institute because there are a lot of involved people that are appearing in the presentation without their authorization. So if you're sitting here, if those people are sitting here, please forgive me, but it's just for the general idea. And especially because this belongs to one antique project of the National Institute of Columbia, which is the eventual creation of a museum of natural history. The Institute von Humboldt was created 23 years ago, and its aim or objective is to promote the knowledge of, bio, of Colombian biodiversity, to recommend to the decision makers the path to take in whatever, whatever they require. The Institute from there, its beginning is holding the biodiversity, the national biodiversity collections, and an image of these collections is in this first slide. We have more than a half a million of examples and topics of herbals and taxonomic features of animals. We also have some genetic collections. Well, it's a classic activity that has been developed around all the world from the illustration. And it has to do with the systematization of knowledge in an organized manner and the knowledge of the world. This knowledge that, that allows us to measure in what planet we are, with whom we share this earth, how many species of spiders, of fishes, where they inhabit, where we have the penguins, where we have the, the, anteo, the glasses bear. And in our case, or in the case of our institution, we have people as Alexander von Humboldt, who was here in Colombia in 1801, in, the, in his route or his path to Chimborazo, where he found his path between Amazonas and Orinoco. And Carol Dows, who was one of the researchers or the theorics in the mathematics and over mathematics and statistics. And these were one of the most important features that gave like an order to this world, a particular order, a rational order, but as well an passionate order. And I, of course, recommend you the biography of both of these characters and the recent German movie that is called Midiendo el Mundo or Measuring the World that undoubtedly presents correctly the perspective that they had in the illustration and in the romantic illustration about how the world works. And at the same time, I want to recognize that from there is where we have where the preoccupation comes of organizing and binding the, the collections with the basic numbers or with, and with the most widened uh, models of reality that can be taken. How from, some, from, a, from a fistful of data we can infer a wider knowledge. And that's what I want to refer myself with the rest of the presentation. How we can connect both things and especially how they could be, of course, uh, told or shared with the, rest of the, with the rest of the world with a museum project that hasn't been done yet in this case. So the procedure, as you can see in the previous photograph, and the way that the science works is to show some light towards what is not seen with clarity. So this is the job of our researcher who is surely discriminating or separating ants according to the, to the morphological features of its body. He's organizing a world that it has been deorganized, or the ones that took the sample deorganized it, right? They're both possibilities. And there's where we have a first pro uh, problem to see how we build knowledge, of course. 
Of course, if all of this comes from a process that, uh, that has to do with the ones that bring the samples to the lab and to see if the world is relatively organized or deorganized. In the Institute, we work permanently, almost like in all the universities of the world in the Department of Biology, doing some taxonomy. And here we have the team of researchers that make the taxonomy in Humboldt. I'm a little bit concerned, but it's the, li it's the only way of having them together in just one photograph. And when this was just some days ago. Of course, we must trust that their perspective of the world will be much more organized than the one, uh, than the one of Alice in Wonderland. But of course, but equally, Lewis Carroll was a great mathematician and an important researcher in the representation of the reality and how the models of the world were, were built. So I won't tell you who is Alice, but she's sitting in this auditorium somewhere. So from there, and from the descriptive science, we begin to connect or reconnect once again the data that come from the field to be able to explain something to those decision makers, those mysterious people that are a particular tribe that usually don't listen to anyone, but we try to let them know the data and telling them, look, the small fish, the bigger fish can, can eat the small one and the small one depends on the phytoplankton. And from this, we have a cycle that depends on the nitrogen and this is a universal cycle. And it's almost like preaching a celestial or a cosmic model when we're talking about a trophic chain or when we're talking about biological elements that are quite simple. But it starts getting worse when you try to talk about an ecosystem, when you try to, to, to bring everything together in a model to talk about ecology. However, the science of ecology, of ecology after Google has progressed substantially, we really have a corpus that explains a lot this relationship between the living being, between these beings, between them and their environment. What is not almost in synteny is the definition of their environment. For some of them, it could be the mountains, the rivers, the habitats, these wild habitats, and not necessarily this orchidiorama like the one we have here, or an airport or a city. In the new ecology, we talk about social ecosystems to try to locate those small insects, that fauna, that flora, in a more complex context. The problem is that when you, when you start talking about making collections of reality in an airport, or here in the orchidiorama, the disorder is given by the same human beings that are trying to understand the same order. So that's where the serpent bites her own tail because we cannot give a reason of something that has been transformed constantly. And the notion of order, once again I insist, is absolutely slippery. This perspective, this slide was the one of the ecosystem, but it, it just came up ahead. So let's imagine this is an, an ecosystem, an urban ecosystem, uh, an ecosystem that is inhabited by princesses, good friends of a neighborhood in Bogotá. And of course, they it wouldn't seem, of course, to fit in, in the most absolute the perspective into the perspective of the biological knowledge in the world. But these butterflies are were very well done in their costumes. So when you go and try to look to another model, another explanation of what of what would be the integration of data, always thinking in Claus and Humboldt. Though in Humboldt, don't think that this is a, an extracurricular activity. We can find, for example, the worlds of, of Yahé, the world of the ayahuasca, and how the ayahuasca laughs at science and says, the world that you're describing is a world absolutely inexistent, and all those data that you take and accumulate in museums and collections are, are representations, are very incomplete representations of what really happens behind, of what really happens. And the only way of understanding what happens is drinking these ayahuasca, this jahe. 
the method hasn't been approved in the institute. Don't worry, we do not make the we do not make any kind of research in in this travel or this world that the ayahuasca creates, right? But there are some that suggested. Ah, now we have the ecosystem. I'm sorry, problem of slides. So just to talk about a very concrete thing and something that really happens in Colombia and something that has happened from some years ago up to the moment, it was that we have to talk about the decision that the Congress of the Republic took about protecting all the ecosystems of high mountains here in Colombia because they are fundamental for the provision of water for the cities and for all the population. So these ecosystems in Venezuela, in Costa Rica, in Colombia, in Equator, in Peru, we call them paramounts. They have the equivalents in Africa and Asia. And, and, the, and are those ecosystems that are not, that do not, are not forests that exist in the peak of the mountains and they're called paramounts due to that name that comes from English, paramount, and comes from the times of the, of the conquerors. So the national governments, to be able to fulfill with this law of the Congress, ordered to identify the paramounts of Colombia. Easy, where are the paramounts? And even many researchers said, well, that's easy. In a month, we will have it ready. And they gave us the image. I don't know if this thing moves. Now, the screen needs the light of the pointer, but I don't know if you can see this more yellowish uh, color among this matrix of, of brown green. That's the paramount. It's visibly evident. It wouldn't require a huge research to tell the government and say, well, there is a paramount. They'll just take a pencil and, of course, start the limit, giving its limits. And from there, we'll take the decisions you must take. However, which are the decisions just to dimension the size of the problem? And it's that within whatever it's in lines, we forbid mining in agriculture. It's not forbidden to, live, forbidden to live. It's not forbidden to walk it, to go over in a trip. It's not forbidden to, to visit it or to harvest some natural elements. But you cannot do agriculture oil exploration or other mining ex uh, experiences with the idea with the problem that in many of these areas there are a lot of agriculture there's a lot of agriculture and mining nowadays and thanks to an order of the constitutional court they should be suspended immediately so when we start looking at the photograph once again we start saying okay let's draw a line and you can suppose and you can start thinking in the huge quantity of interest that there is, depending on where we draw the line, how precise this line can be in reality. So the images belong to different scales of approximation to the effect of what we would call the usage of the macroscope to start approaching until we can see to see how we configure the limit of the paramount with the neck with the with the forestal system that comes again so if we say take a pencil and draw a line next to the frontier where we can find as you can see we will see that there are a quantity of spots there are a quantity of elements that have problems and these are problems of identity because the paramount just like us has problems of identity we must take care in how we manage the paramount and that frontier because 200 hectares that go within the paramount that belong to a, a mining multinational could represent a demand of millions or billions of dollars to the nation or vice versa. Areas of paramount that are necessary for the ecological function of the country that are not within that line could be destroyed and generate a great damage to the nation. So this line that seemed to be so easy at the beginning, well, give us, gave us something to eat for five years, right? Sustained us. But towards the end, when you start looking really close and you get to the plants and the animals and the components of the ecosystem, you say, that's a paramount. I don't know if you all know it. If you have time and you stay in Medellin, you will see that you will see some very close paramounts. They are organized, uh, you know, 
hiking activities that are pretty close. There are between 3,200 um, meters above the sea level, and they will be easily represented. They have frailejones, which is this plant that you can see there. You have wetlands that are these greenish colors that we can see there that are like sludge in, of high mountains. We have glacial peaks that are those peaks that you can see there. So if the limit is kind of, you know, blurry, when you start going there and you start putting together all these objects, you can start looking a little bit more of this level of uncertainty. So, but this is just something partial. And we haven't achieved it in the total part. As a matter of fact, there are paramounts that do not have frailejones. There are paramounts that do not have rocky formations of glacial formation, but they have from volcanic formation. There are some that do not have wetlands because they are lands. And there are paramounts that are created due to the action of human actions. And starting to draw once again, this line becomes difficult. Towards the end, we did it because it was a task. It was a mandate from the government. And we proposed to an atlas of paramounts. And it was delivered, or this proposal of delimitation was delivered. But all these definitions that could not be resolved through science, through research, through this putting all these Lego parts of the knowledge were ha had to be solved in the desk of the lawyers how to draw the line in an adequate and a balanced way so that the interests of no one were, were affected in a differential manner. So the magazine, Semana Sostenible, uh, men, had a headline that is called The Fracaso of Santurban, The Failure of Santurban. Five years ago, it was limited. It was demanded. Of course, there was a sue over this due to the topics of the protection of the ecosystem. There are, of course, sues from the mining industry. But not only that, but in this moment, we have a huge social conflict in which the map that you have above shows the limit that was adopted by the decree of the paramount. And, it, and that's in the, in the dark green. And we have the request of a mining company in the yellow part. And the social movement that through this month is being developed that says, despite that the paramount was delimited in a scientific manner to forbid the mining, they do not believe the process and the space where we have the, the mining company must be protected as, as, as a paramount. But it's not a paramount. The science has already identified that. The people say, we do not care. We do not want the gold. We just want our everything nature. But the, but the law says that it's not possible. So I've already mentioned the topic of the limitation, the topic of identity, and that small and thin line that divides a decision that mobilizes thousands and thousands of people. And the guys that are around signing are signing to, to oppose this licensing to the paramount. So we are between the white queen and the red queen going back to Alice, because when they saw telling us your process of investigation of five years that uh, has determined scientifically, uh, has determined an object, a paramount, to manage it, is, well, is not enough, is not adequate, it's not complete. We're missing something, and what's missing? The people say the millimeter, that scale. We need to delimit the paramount to know if from this table to here, it's a paramount or not. But we say it's impossible because the paramount is a gigantic object. You cannot delimit with levels of millimeters an object that has thousands of hectares. And they say, why not? And we say, because the borders are, are not clear. It doesn't work like that. So it's an epistemological uh, topic, right? And we have to free ourselves a bit of those barriers that are difficult in, to know what things are or what are the things that we have to manage. I want to take my epistemological restriction here <laughs> to recognize that it's a little bit heavy to use. Besides, I know you're distracted because of that. 
So we must start reflecting about the identity of things, the identity of the paramounts, the identity of the things, the identity of the frailejones. Why are they there and why aren't they there? So that's something that we call having like a mental caries. You know? And we have to go to the ontologist to make a consultation to try to define those identities of uh, those problems of identity. I usually go to him, to these ontologists, so I can manage these topics. Uh, let's say that in the, st the, in the institute we have already an ontologist, our head ontologist. And better, and even better, to see how we're going to create the, mount, the Museum of Natural Sciences of the Paramount to know that with the objects that we're going to start telling this narrative that gives a reason to that, those, to that nature that we want to protect or those social relationships that we want to manage. Well, let's say that all of this is in the hands of doubtful identities. This is the Museum of Madrid, not the Humboldt. Huh? So when you start looking in history, in the history of the constructions or let's say the delimitations of biodiversity, you of course can find wonderful things. Some of those, we have brought them here to Explora and other opportunities. And they have to do a lot with the difficulty of people understanding that idea that Colombia, just as many of the countries, are mega diverse which means they have thousands of different birds, thousands of different kind of frogs, toads, fishes. And if you ask any kind of citizen to tell them how many birds you know or have you seen, or, you, or how many could you identify in your daily life, they could say five, ten. If it's a member of our rural community and they are interested, they can say I recognize 20. But that recognition, when we ask it graphically, ends up being completely inconsistent with the taxonomies of the scientists. And they say, well, those 20 that you could recognize are really just two, but it's the male and the female in different colors and different times of, of, of coming together. And they say, and when they tell me, hey, how many birds do you know? And I say, well, I distinguish this, this, and this one. As a matter of fact, the, the taxonomists struggle every, every time with the same thing, and they have to go into the genome of the animals to see if they are really different or not. Mr. Giuseppe Baquet, uh, he, was, he was a policeman in 1890. He began building an atlas of animals or imaginary beings. And during four decades, he built almost 1,500 uh, beings that were populating his imagination. If I put this atlas next to the catalog of Colombian diversity and I mix them, it will be very possible that a great part of these imaginary beings will be recognized by the people as, as daily inhabitants of the ecosystems and they will say i have seen them that orange little bug with with legs and and wings i saw them the last week and they were going above the wall of the kitchen and they ate my food and, and they said yeah but was that a, a test with all the statistics of gauss and everything no they say no i hit him with my sandal i have it here just see it so what caused me more preoccupation when I looked for the biography about Joseph Bakhti, they told me I found that her, his mom started dressing him as a girl when he was a child uh, because she wanted a, a daughter, right? So you understand the problems of this guy. So let's go to another topic now. How do we build the identity of the objects and culture? You do that every day. Every time, as a matter of fact, the museums are devices created for that precisely, to represent identities in conflict or to diminish this dissonance of the conflict, of the ontological conflict that we have between the components of anything. 
for me, this catalog of impossible objects is wonderful. We we spoke about this with the conference of the pataphysics, that's what we call it, and these are impossible concepts. But definitely, if you have if you have um, an amazing device to save water, it would be this one. If we have safe forks to not, you know, to not punch yourself or to kids not get hurt, will be these ones. Or to roll the pasta and to avoid that the pasta doesn't get, you know, with stains. Well, it's this one, you know, there are uses for these objects. And somebody will, will bring these, these uses because somebody brought them to reality. When we start researching about our own participation in this identity world, that's where we have a huge problem. And for an instant, just look between yourselves to see that we have a serious problem. We're all very different. Each one of us, as a matter of fact, would deserve to be in a, in a you know, in a display of a curiosities. And sometimes we would like to put some people there, you know, in alcohol or something in a bottle. But, but the result is every time more this hilarious world of the classifications of the gender between the human beings. And, and, and usually people start asking me with a lot of respect or sometimes not, what kind of, of animal are you? Are you a, an ant? Are you a Martian? Are you... A, are you an alien? Are you in the classification of this guy of that we were seeing before? So there's a web page that is called Identity Project where you can identify yourselves and eventually come out with a denomination there in English and it's difficult to <laughs> translate them, but you would be a gender queer, tender heart, baba, or something like that, you know. But it's like choosing ice cream flavors. Can you give me a, a, a ball of vanilla with raisins, but take out the strawberry sauce, but you put a, a, you know, this cookie with chocolate, but die, and you start building these identities, right, like that. Of course, this will not bring any ease to the researchers that work with identities. Even more complicated yet. Between 80 and 105 ethnical groups that are native from Colombia. Each one of them have their language and each of them has an organization of the world. For some of them, ants are not ants, they are beetles. For others, uh, birds are the same thing as monkeys because they jump between trees. For others, the reality is not the same. And yeah, you could translate it partially, but when you're going to take decisions seriously about life, of course, those translations will be imperfect. You know, this linguistical, this language barrier will always exist. And each one of them insists in dressing as they want. And that's another problem of identity that is quite evident, where we say, we are like this, we live here, and the others are not ourselves. And you start saying, OK, how can we build a museum that can give a reason of these eccentricities? And I talk about eccentric elements when we talk about statistical elements, right? Peripheric and saying that only 1.25% of the population in Colombia are from indigenous populations or that detect another system of knowledge that is not the, the normative one of the Occident and scientific part, right? So, oh, we mixed all the slides. I, I'm sorry, it always happens with me. I mix the slides and some come ahead and others not. But this slide was coming also talking that about these I indigenous identities and the queer identity identities. Let's say that the problems could be seen in a much more simple manner. It's just about talking, just about for talking about man and woman. How do we build the feminine elements and how do we build the masculine elements in the world? How is it represented? And the bottom line question comes is if being man or woman implies having visions and knowledge of the world that are different. If women see the same ants that the men see or not, right? If the men are trained in the same manner to be models of the world, just as women. So to all of these questions, there are answers and possibilities of discussion from the, epi from the epistemology. 
but perhaps the question is not the adequate one, because the starting point between man and woman contains a previous definition. It contains a taxonomy that was established that is also brings like this nature. It's supposed we suppose that everybody knows what is a man and a woman, and there is a biological data, and there are some specimens or some types that are in a museum so that people can go see them, analyze them, and touch them. And based on this, we can build these, you know, these, these, these names in the bathrooms, right? Because you go, you go with clothes to the bathroom. So in the bathrooms, you can see the taxonomy in the, in the entrance of the bathrooms to see if there is an identity data from the point of view of the biology that can help you go into the bathroom, right? And that allows me to differ to make a difference with, like, to what bathroom I can go. I always have that problem, you know? I don't know it's about what bathroom going. If you ask, it's worse, so it's a great question. And, of course, the ecofeminism has worked to reduce this natural reductionism that is creating an identitary construction that is absolutely political. It's very political and it has been built with the intention of building a domination, with the intention of building a message of truth that is imposed upon the difference of the other. So what comes in this political process? Yeah. What comes in this political process is to build either the difference or to build the truth. And depending on what we decide, uh, depending on how these uh, truths are imposed, how difference is imposed, or how differences question truth. And based on this is basically uh, what we are immersed on on a daily basis in our institutions. In your institutions, I'm sure you have permanent similar discussions with regards to what do we show people, what do we exhibit, and what is our claim, and how much truth do we present, and how honestly do we present it. And based on that, we define uh, the type of relationships that are established. And we also define the narrative that we're going to use to narrate, to interact with society, regardless if it is a natural history museum or a contemporary art museum. I am a, bi I'm a, bio I am a biologist. I defend the idea that diversity produces diversity. Uh, this happens constantly, and I also know that any uh, evolutionary change or transformational change of living beings is always going to create more differences, unless uh, it is an extermination process or an, a systematic elimination process with regards to differences, with regards to the elimination of differences. And, and this process is both uh, biological as well as social. And I do know that our experience of the natural and what we learn is a cultural learning. Uh, and the, but the only way we can account for the world is through our interpretation of the world, through the use of our cognitive tools. So even though, even so, natural history museums or cultural museums, even so. Uh, this part of the this is part of the discussion that can be applied to any type of identity problem. If instead of a sex and gender, we change those words for species and ecosystems, or we say whatever, we select whatever pair of words with regards to culture or nature, we will always have problems. What is really natural? What claims to be the absolute truth? what is primigenous to knowledge and what is a result of our interpretation. Again, this is the same problem that I mentioned earlier with regards to scientists imposing the order of the world or if the world came with its order. I am not a philosophist. This is, as many of you may know, this is part of an everyday discussion in many sides. It still exists, otherwise it would not be relevant and it is present in natural history museums quickly, constantly. What is the nature of these museums in our 2017? This definition is in English to respect the author. This is with regards to what is queer, because again, that's the title of my presentation. Queer is a word that cannot be translated. It's a term invented in the 1990s in conferences with regards to gender, and this is basically uh, the result of the discussion of selecting one single identity model for the expression of sexuality and gender of human beings. 
Research afterwards has discovered that this topic of gender and sex is equally complicated for all uh, living species, and it is also problematic, and perhaps it can even be more problematic for other species, because in the world of biology, there's everything and more. So this notion of queer is quite interesting. As indicated here in this definition, it indicates that there is something in the middle of certainties. Uh, there is a space in between those where reality becomes quite slippery where ontology cannot provide limits. It's sort of like uh, nature's own limitation of the world, and this is intrinsic to the existence of things. Nothing is completely irreductible, and as a matter of fact, part of the problems that we are speaking about today are related to this claim to reduce this knowledge object to pure conditions, to an identity condition, to an identity condition that is absolutely clear, in other words, an excess of clarity with regards to what you study. If we were to light uh, things that we want to learn from a frontal perspective, sooner or later we're going to lose the value of shadows, shadows that also change with the movement of the light. This is the queer theory. In other words, there is a space with regards to knowledge that can only be seen through the edge of your eye. And I think we have a tremendous that with Mary uh, Shelley, uh, Wilson uh, Craft, uh, the author of Frankenstein or the new Prometheus. Uh, uh, about a hundred years and six weeks ago, Mary Shelley concluded uh, this uh, first uh, work as a result. This was the result of a literary challenge uh, from her maid and from friends. And this gave rise to perhaps the most uh, firm question in that society has with regards to epistemology, Frankenstein, that is. Here in this image is an interpretation of Lady Frankenstein, 1934, and this has continued evolving. It's in the comics now and are now is part of the Marvel Universe. This one here has four arms, and I would uh, anyway like to show the static contrast between this monstrous femininity and monstrous masculinity. There are other types of monstrosity, as you can see. And furthermore, there's a movie about Lady Frankenstein by Andy Warhol. And his questioning was if we can create a live monster, a live monsters, lo monster, that would be the synthesis of humanity failure, in other words. Why don't we create a masculine of course the virtues of humanity in Warhol, Warhol's imaginary were all sex so this synthesis of female virtues according to him are a result of desire that uh, black uh, f type of black film was not very prosperous fortunately how do we stitch together all these pieces of reality how do we bring the liver with the head, with the brain together after we have researched and fragmented the ecosystem, after we have named all the parts and all the sub parts and the sub 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 parts? How do we stitch all these parts together again? Well, in stitching is where we have the details. How do we stitch the paramount with the forest? What kind of process, epistemological process, do we use to recreate the world and show it to others? This is basically the struggle of the paramount delimitation process. Again, this is an image that reflects the difficulty of those transition areas and those linguistic uh, aspects that we have to limit those and regarding the subjective decisions that attorneys and politicians have to take to define what is what. De la sexualidad humana. We are in a very similar position with regards to human sexuality. It is politicians and lawyers 
uh, the ones that have to take decisions, whether uh, consulted, researched or not. But uh, there is always a level of violence that has to be exercise upon reality. In biology, this is really not that serious because an ant is an ant today, tomorrow may be a beetle, and well, there's really nothing happening there uh, besides taxonomists meeting in Congress and perhaps having an argument about that, but that is not the end of the world, in other words. Uh, but when a human being says, uh, fails in love with, say, artificial intelligence, just like in this movie, her, then we go into deeper problems. I'm about to close my presentation for uh, constructing a museum. This topic of identity is quite basic. How do we uh, define this uh, gamble, this bet that we're taking on identity? the identity of things, subjects, narratives. That is very important because that implies artistic decisions, passionate decisions, that implies linguistic decisions. And we have to recognize that the identity of all this is actually quite vulnerable. Anything that I decide to do in Explora is going to be full of uh, risk and fate this is why this science is a high risk sport, is an extreme sport. But we have fun, don't we? There's plenty of adrenaline in our discussions as curators, and we all know that. We all know, know of passionate, passionate crimes in the middle of this uh, debate or discussions as to how to organize uh, an exhibit. So this is why I'm posing these two questions. Is it desirable or convenient to reorganize a museum based on the questioning of the nature of the identity of its components? In other words, ants plus birds plus plants. Am I going to question the identity of those or am I going to assume their identity as th things that have full validity? And based on that, I begin to build. Or the other option, I can question the nature of the relationships between those components. In other words, I spend more time in determining the liver that I am use, going to use for a Frankenstein, or the way I'm going to stitch it so it works as a, so it works as a result of my creativity and uh, implementation of my proposal. I would say that here we have, in this uh, queer theory, we have a very interesting opportunity to speak deeply about the identity of gender and sexuality and, mo and about many other things, and to speak about how these narratives that connect everything are developed, especially because this is a theory that does not cling to uh, demolish or abolish reality. In other on the other side, it recognizes that there are spaces for uncertainty, which cannot be reduced and which are also fun because that is where we have a space to make our own decisions. Although this is a result of the theory of postmodernity, a structuralist criticism, this theory does not want to dissolve reality nor eliminate the identity of objects. It only wants to question with irony if these identities are really robust, as, as robust as we believe they are. And more than anything, what is the effect of us believing these narratives? What is the effect of us believing that reality is clearer and clearer as days go by, better and better defined? this reality where objects of knowledge are supposed to be pure. This uh, perspective, I believe, is quite concerning from my own personal perspective, because what it generates is this constant fragmentation of the narratives, and it also generates the impossibility of being able to connect again in seen scenarios, in scenarios where we can find the connectivities that we need for humanity to advance. The eight that you can see on this image, these are the panarchic cycles proposed in a uh, recent ecological and complex system theory. And what it says is that in this uh, space of instability of objects, in this uh, time of uh, 
when identities are so uh, worn and torn in this space is where creativity and adaptation occur to adapt to new challenges and to move the universe in a teleological way so it remains alive as well. So therefore, if you accept a critique of these uh, models of knowledge, again, not trying to destroy it, but to reinterpret it, this is where museums of art and museums of natural history, this is where they come together. And in addition to these new qualities uh, surge, a uh, new reality surge as well. mythical tales that we reject as somehow because they are quite folkloric. The origin of humanity is to the left of this uh, slide. Humanity in Bogota, this is the myth. A, whim, a woman came out of a lake and she bore a child. We do not know where the child came from. Uh, the child grew up, uh, they became a couple and they and they populated the planet. After they populated the planet, the woman went back into the lake and she became a snake. This is the myth of the creation of humanity. So it's sort of like an Adam and Eve reloaded. Here the snake came after, uh, well, it, it is sort of like a similar myth. This is the myth regarding the origin of humanity for our Chipsha culture which lived near Bogota and this girl in the Game of Thrones, she, ga she came from fire, according to the series. But please remember that countries in the north of Europe, uh, they have a, a myth that indicates that they come uh, from a mythical relationship between dragons and women. So what are the options? After several ontological consultations, what are the options to build identity projects again? Projects that are not authoritarian, projects that are not dogmatic, in other words, projects that are flexible, pedagogical, and that do not result in these types of things. Uh, this erotic engineering, which uh, basically does not contribute much to the evolution of humanity, although they may pacify some people. But in this uh, museographic uh, display of rubber and mechanical bodies, uh, this uh, brings us to think what new narratives different from Frankenstein's may surge. Uh, but these dolls are going to have uh, artificial intelligence sooner or later. They're going to learn the lives of their clients. They're going to have algorithms uh, similar to the algorithms that we have in different applications that ask you what you like and what you do not like. So they define uh, the identities of this new entity. So this is really not harmless. We are building new objects, new elements from the ecosystems in a new uh, context of new relationships. Some of these, some of us may uh, think that these relationships are simulated and some of them may be a structuring. Uh, how much do we, how much of a female or masculine perspective do we have with regards to knowledge, to behavior, to the world? Uh, what are the qualities, identity qualities of gender that we apply to our knowledge of the world? And I think there we have a, a large uh, amount of uh, differentiating criteria. They have been, of course, developed through history through different learning and differentiation processes. You all may be familiar with the evolution process of bi biology that indicates each one of these lines indicates uh, thousands of species that have appeared in different taxonomic sets in history. Uh, for instance, a fish from the Cretacic period and so on. And 
the beginning is in the center and the history of humanity can be narrated as this type of a spiral or it can be narrated as a wave with sub waves and some of these sub waves are being uh, ch nano technological or cybernetic because this is the next step for building beings that are going to populate the world and these are not um, beings in our dreams in our psychedelic drugs these are beings and that have been always with us they're not made of flesh and blood but they are beings anyway uh, we need to think if um, this type of exercise with regards to this ontological doubt resulting from the queer theory we need to ask ourselves if this is satisfactory in terms of ethics we need to ask what its effects are. We need to uh, speak about the effects that it has. A classical perspective of knowledge that is still remains in many museums and this is still very important to account for the world. Or a more liquid perspective of reality in which we can dare uh, have new narratives and new interpretations of our lives and the lives of the world. A day without a doubt relate to a topic of uh, managing our own freedoms. Deseo, museo, deseo. Desire, museum, desire. Literally translates. A museum is a space for desiring more because museums are spaces for knowledge. This is my Brigitte, and her last uh, Twitter photograph, uh, although apparent she, apparently she resigned to being the queen of desire, she can still show that at 80 years old she still has desires. But how do I feel we can reimagine museums? Well, we can reimagine them as a device that provides reason between intersubjectivity as a basis for all knowledge. In other words, science does not claim to know it all, but many political systems do claim to know it all. So museums can be sort of like a pattern, emerging pattern detector to detect new things, new identities that are being cooked somewhere in the world. Some are not viable, definitely, some are some are going to create uh, gigantic phylogenies, but we do not know who we're going to send to populate Mars. But in 100 years, we're going to populate Mars. Mars is not going to be like Earth. The next point is museum as, a co as an aesthetic co-narrator. There's and a political actor as well. No museum is free from the government. Even if we fight the government every day, the government is still going to dictate what we show and what we do not show. And they're going to tell us how to do it. And financing means is always going to be a, a, a tool, a power tool to determine if we show bear and or not. And finally, museums as a revealing body of this uh, mystery mystery meaning the glue that allows us to create new realities but not a glue that not a permanent glue or not a glue that anchors uh, things next to others therefore I believe that a queer museum does not document uh, sort of like a monster displays it should instead help produce future monsters. Thank you very much.